Okay, hello students, good morning. Uh, I've already taken the attendance of all those who have been on time to class. I've already recorded uh, like whoever has been present in the class and I've already taken down with me. Uh, so let's begin with the class. Let's try to remember the rules in mind. After 30 minutes, uh, I'll not be allowing anyone to enter the class. Okay, um, now last class we learned about, what did we learn? Can someone recapitulate for me? Can any one of you recapitulate? Can anyone tell me what we learned during the last class? Okay, so you want me to pick any student? I told you class interaction, uh, you know, carries marks as well. I would assess students on the basis of the class interaction as well. What did we learn during the last class? I give you three minutes. You can even go through your notes and tell me. Yes. Yes, good morning, Master Martin. Yeah, good morning, Adam. Tell me. Yes, Adam, go on. What did we learn during the last class? Wow. So from next class onwards, I'll pick any student and you will have to tell me what we learned during the last class in the sense you will have to recapitulate whatever you have learned during the previous session and that's going to be part of your assignment as well. So now let's move further. So the first class we learned about the types of leadership. We spoke about leadership in the general perspective. You know that you're studying about leadership in the social service sector's perspective. But however, in the first class, the very first session, we learned about leadership, the types of leadership, the different models of leadership. So in the next class, we learned about professional turfs in social service organization. We spoke about the importance of profession. We also spoke about whether social service is a profession or a business. And we give reference to a prominent person in the field uh, who's a theorist as well, as well in the social service sector, as well as social service personnel and an author, Harold. And he said that uh, social service is a business as well as a, a profession. It could be seen as a business as well as profession. Then we spoke about how social service has evolved over the years. We spoke about the, the, the concept of social service has always been there you know, since time, ha uh, since man has always existed. Why did we say that? Because it is an inherent quality in a human being to support one another. It is part of you. It is something invincible. It is part of you. It is inherent. That's when you know you go ahead to support someone. However, I would say the the degree of support that you might render to someone or a person may render to someone else may vary. However, every human being has a heart, and you are normally inclined towards helping someone and you know, contributing towards a society in your own little way or when you are blessed to be a social worker, you move out into the field and contribute towards the enhancement of the society and obliterating or removing out every evil from the society, you work towards that goal. So we have learned over the two classes today being the third session or the third lecture. So the two classes you have learned about the relevance of leadership in the social service or even the human service sector. We learned about the difference between social service and human service. And uh, I remember one of you asked me the difference between social service and human service, the thin line or the hairline difference, which is that. And we learned about social service being a subset of human service. 
we spoke about again reiterating the different models of leadership or the types of leadership we spoke about autocratic bureaucratic uh, and uh, and so on we learned about different models and today we are going to learn about a leadership model which is relevant to the social service sector or even the human service sector note that the types of leadership that we studied earlier is not relevant or is uh, you know it's not going to be uh, you know palpably manifested in the social service sector or it's not that it is not manifest there or it is not seen there clearly however these two models that we're going to discuss today we have bifurcated it uh, into uh, you know self leadership and distributed leadership I'm repeating again. Today we are going to study about the highly relevant models which are prevalent in the social service sector, or rather, where we actually see, or it's manifest in the social service sector. The types of leadership that is manifest in the social service sector is, you know, uh, self leadership and, you know, distributed leadership. You could also say that self leadership is. Uh, you know, where you train yourself to be a leader and everyone is actually a leader within themselves. If you think about it, leadership is just not, you know, confined uh, to the plate of limited few. It's not just served to limited few. It's not the question of it being served, but it is inherent quality of every human being. The difference is how you uh, you know, nurture it in how you polish it and how you train yourself. I'm repeating, leadership is actually inherent quality of every person. Okay, you might not, um, you know, concur with me now, or rather you wouldn't agree with me now at this point, probably you will have certain questions in your mind. Why is she saying that leadership is inherent to every person? Not all are leaders. We are not leaders. She's not a leader. Example, however, leadership is a skill, it's an art, it's a quality that is inherent in every human being. For example, let me give you a very simple example, which I've also incorporated it in my slides there, which we'll be you know, going through after some time, just after our discussion here. For example, think about this. Our mother, your mother, my mother, are they trained into leadership? Of course, you know, uh, you know, forget about the profession part of it or their profession or what they do actually. We'll forget about that. Or let us uh, go to, uh, you know, uh, forget about us. Let's go to um, a, a remote setup. A remote setup or a place where, you know, there is a um, high level of illiteracy, for example. <laughs> And of course, the role of social service is to go and one of the roles would be to obliterate literacy, illiteracy, sorry, and bring about literacy by having literacy campaigns. Now, if you have seen women who normally are housewives or run the household, housewife, to be a housewife also is a gift. It's a pleasure. It's a gift. And it's a role, an important role. But are they really trained into taking care of their households? Think about a remote setup. Don't talk about, you know, the present world, or of course, even in the present world in the remote setup. Think about this. Women who are mothers, are they trained to be a mother? Is she really trained to take the reins of a house in her hands? Is she trained to spank her child, to discipline her child and tell her this is the way you should go in life? Think about this. She's not trained. Whatever may be her situation, whatever may be the woman's situation or the lady's situation, she is trained to lead. She is trained to, she's got the inherent quality to lead her children, to show them the right path and to teach them what is good and what is bad that is the difference between right and wrong it's just a simple example i'm giving you so i'm sure by now you should say that yes all of us are leaders it's just that difference is where we are implementing those leadership skills and where we need to polish it now, having thus set the perspective let us now go through our slides see this subject is quite a general subject it's an easy subject you just need to understand it 
and develop the habit of reading whatever is taught in the class. You are in fact privileged where you're receiving also lecture points and kind of notes that is always uploaded after each and every class. So I think you're quite privileged for that, apart from even the PPTs, which are, you know, uh, you know, uploaded in the system in your Google Classroom. So you already have access, you're equipped with all the materials. So you are highly encouraged now to, you know, to really go back read the material which is provided to you, come back and for the next class, it's not me who will begin the class, I'm going to give you an opportunity um, and in fact going to assess wherever I ask to, you know, recapitulate today's session. Mute your mic, please mute your mic. So self-leadership and distributed leadership. So these are two prominent models that are prevalent or normally that manifest in the social service sector. Self-leadership and distributed leadership. Now, as we learned earlier, leadership is an art and a skill. It is an art, it is a skill, a skill that needs to be fed and nourished with appropriate training. I'm sure you would agree with me on that. It's an art, it's an art to execute, it's a skill, a skill that needs to be fed and nourished with appropriate training. Now it is inherent in professional practice, of course, you know, I'm sure you know this. Professional practice, whichever profession a person may belong to, it is inherent in a professional. You know, this quality of leadership is normally, you know, in them. And it's also assessed at the time of interviews and also during, you know, job performance. How the person takes lead, how the person, uh, you know, leads the team, how the person, uh, you know, resolves any conflicting situation you know, any problems. So how the person takes the lead, how the person really, uh, you know, flows with the situation and tries to nip the matter in the bud, you see? So that's to take lead. So it is inherent in professional practice, be it any profession, be it a lawyer, a doctor, now a social worker, or, uh, you know, a teacher, a lecturer, you know, in any profession for that matter, management consultant, you know, any profession, it is a part of them to be leader. So that's why in the corporate world, we say that managers are leaders. However, recently I read an article which was written by a woman. I'm, I'm not quite able to uh, remember her name at the moment. She said that leadership is distinct from managing, and it's not, uh, it's uh, really not necessary that managers should be leaders. That was her opinion. However, uh, you know, I have a dice. I dissent from her opinion. It's like, um, of course, I would go with the normal edge that has the corporate edge that has been laid over the years that managers are leaders as well because. A good manager should be a good leader. He should be able to, uh, you know, lead his team and should be able to get the work done. It, it is an art. He has to be able to execute tasks and get it done from his team. It's an art. It's an art to be a leader. You know, so every manager should, should be, you know, a leader. So I would rather say that, you know, all managers need to be leaders but it's not necessary that all leaders need to be managers. So therefore, coming back to this subject, it is inherent in professional practice 
And it's, of course, much reflected in the business world that leadership is an invaluable skill, something which cannot be, it's, it's something which is invincible. It is part of them, it is inherent. It is part of them, it's part of the system. So management of any organization for that matter attracts the need for competent professionals and managers to govern the affairs of the organization within the parameters of the organizational mandate. So likewise, social service sector magnets or attracts the demand for professional leaders as well. Remember Holbert, he said way back in 1923, that's what we studied earlier. Holbert said that it is a profession. He spoke about it being a business, but he also said it's a profession. So social service sector, it magnets the demand for professional leaders as well, especially owing to the fact that the sector has emerged and evolved to be considered as a business or even profession, as Holbert L.A. opined way back in 1923. Now, the bifurcation of leadership models, that is where you branch it out or divide it into two, which is a prominent feature in the social service sector, the type of models which are there. One is self-leadership. You know, by the term itself, it should, you know, strike a chord in your mind saying that what it must be, self-leadership and distributed leadership. Self-leadership and distributed leadership. So the self-leadership is to primarily regulate oneself and then lead others, rightly as David Taylor Clause is said to have remarked once that, first be a leader of yourself, only then you can grow to lead others. I'm repeating that it's quite interesting, uh, you know, remark that he has made there. He is David Taylor Clause. He said, first, be a leader yourself. And only then can you grow to lead others. So in the management perspective, the concept of self-leadership was first reflected in the treaties by uh, you know, Charles Siemens in 1983. There was you know, a management uh, you know, article and books that Charles Siemens had written in 1983. And he was of the opinion that self-leadership uh, you know, is a must. And this concept of self-leadership was actually first seen in the treatise by Charles C. Nance in 1983. Now, Mans defined self-leadership as comprehensive self-influence perspective that concerns leading oneself towards performance of naturally motivating tasks as well as managing oneself to do work that must be done but is not naturally motivating he talks about self-influencing that is that concerns itself with leading oneself towards performance so the term self-leadership first emerged from the organizational management literature by charles c mans in 1983 who later defined it as comprehensive self-influence perspective, this is the reputation of the above, I've reiterated that, that concerns leading oneself towards performance of naturally motivating tasks, as well as managing oneself to do work that must be done, but is not naturally motivating. What does he mean by saying not naturally motivating? He says, the first thing that you need to do is you will have to be reminiscent of, or you will have to, you know, remember that there is this quality of leadership in you. It is naturally there, but you must remember that it is there. It is not naturally motivating, but you have to, you know, bring it to your mind that this, the leadership quality is in me. So that's what he's trying to say. So he's saying that you need to, inculcate the habit of self-influencing yourself and taking the lead towards performance of certain tasks by motivating yourself. And this aspect of motivation, it's not necessary that it would naturally come to you, but you need to get up and do it. You have to, you know, 
inculcate the habit of self-influencing and self-leading towards a achieving a particular task or a goal that is set before you. It may not come naturally, but you need to do it. Before we move further, just in case we get disconnected, please join back. So coming back to the slide, thereby self-leadership entails sharpening the leadership skills that you originally possess. And the leader in you emerges forth to accomplish what is required of you more efficiently. I gave you the example of a housewife. This is what I put here in the slide as well. For example, a simple housewife is a leader. She's a born leader, even as suppressed as she may be. It depends upon the society she belongs to, whether she's suppressed or not. It may not be quite, uh, you know, uh, manifest in today's society, but still there are pockets in the world where women are really suppressed. It depends upon, you know, country to country, society to society, it depends. There are instances where even in, in, in an advanced society, women are normally suppressed, or rather she feels suppressed. Now, again, whether she is suppressed and she feels suppressed, <laughs> there are two different aspects here. Now, whether she feels suppressed is something else and whether she is really suppressed is another aspect. Whatever it may be, she is a born leader as she may be, depending upon the society she belongs to her, I mean, she belongs to or her circumstances, but she certainly does lead and she takes the reins of her household, trains her children in the ways of life and so on. So thereby the qualities of being a leader are not reserved for the chosen few, but every human has a leader hidden in them. And self-leadership is about recognizing your leadership traits, sharpening them and putting them into action. So this is what self-leadership is that you recognize your leadership traits that doesn't actually happen automatically or it does not just you know happen or come naturally to any person but you need to you know recognize it so the first aspect is recognizing the leadership traits sharpening them and then putting it into action now the regal seven all the important seven self-training strategies for self-leadership. The first thing is motivate yourself and take up challenges in the social service sector, human service tasks that are, this is something that you can incorporate yourself as a social worker or, you know, being a social worker or that you are going to be one, because last time one of you said that you are not really into the field at the moment, you said you are still students. So these are some of the strategies you can inculcate and yeah. adapt to, you know, train yourself. So self-training strategies. One is motivate yourself and take up challenges in the social service sector or the human service tasks that are allotted to you. Now, it's not about competing with others. This is not just relevant to the social service, uh, you know, sector, but it's everywhere. And this is what I've been believing in for years. It's not about competing with others, but self-competing to be a better version of yourself every time you perform participate in training programs that nurtures your emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence, you see that you uh, know how to react in different situations. When something hard is thrown at you, you know how to, you know, be resilient towards that and you know how to bounce back to be, uh, and be normal and you know how to react to a particular situation or not react at all. So your emotional intelligence and build your leadership competencies. The next thing is, or the next strategy is to solicit or request feedback from the team with whom you're working. Peer groups and the ones to whom you report, that is the managers, your bosses, it depends on so request feedback from them and see where you stand. Next is build resilience, build your vision, and be vigilant. The fifth one is learn to grasp risks, learn to take risks. When you are certain or you think that you can strike at or you will be well able to handle, learn to take risks, risks that you think you can manage, risks that you think will enable you to grow. Next is stand up against evil practice. 
that are against society building and human building. And the seventh one is stand up for your team and the organization you are part of. So these are the seven regals, self-training strategies of self-leadership. There is this Project Lift campaign in Scotland. Uh, in fact, that is a quite plausible move. The Project Lift campaign in Scotland, which is actually in the health sector, health and social care sector. So this was a plausible move in the health and social care sector in Scotland, which is of course, the Project Lift campaign, which encompasses programs or which includes programs to recruit, that is employ, retain, develop, and main, manage human resources within the sector, that is to manage the people within the sector. So it's just about recruiting them, retaining them, and developing their skills and how they manage human resources sector human resources or people within the sector, people management, that's ensuring the instilling of leadership qualities and refining the skills in the sector. So this is an, actually a campaign which is prevalent in Scotland, especially in the health and the social care sector, which you know, ensures that leadership qualities are refined in people that they are recruiting, retaining, and they are seeking to develop their other skills and predominantly leadership skills. Now, theories of self-leadership, there are different theories. One is building self-control, which was actually put forth by Carver and Scher in 1981. Next is social cognitive theory, which is actually put forth by Bandura in 1986. That social cognitive is basically it, this theory basically uh, aims at measuring behavioral pattern. Next is self-determination theory. This is something that was uh, you know, they really identified this as a theory, uh, and this was identified by Jesse and Ryan in 1985, and self-determination, that means it tries to link the gap between self-motivation and the results that, the results of self-motivation. Then self-actualization theory that can be referenced to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where he had different, you know, there is a a pyramid that Maslow has given and where self-actualization is part of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And next is self-management was actually proposed by Daniel Goldman in 2005, where according to Goldman, it is an important pillar in leadership that you need to have the art of managing yourself as well. So these are some of the theories of self-leadership. The next part is distributed leadership. Before we move to you know distributed leadership, talking about self leadership, the thing about this, they're saying that like any other field, of course, in the social service sector, self leadership is a very important aspect.